Hello, friends, and welcome to episode 645 of the Juicebox Podcast. Today I'm going to be speaking with Becky, and I don't want to tell you too much about this episode because I don't want to ruin it. It's a delight. You're going to have a romp, a hell of a good time. It's going to be something else. You'll be listening to Becky. She is an adult with type 1 diabetes, and i um, not comfortable telling you anything more than that. You're just going to have to listen to find out more. While you're listening... Please remember that nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Please always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan or becoming bold with insulin. If you have type 1 diabetes or you're the caregiver of someone with type 1 diabetes and you're a U.S. resident, could I please ask you to go to t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box Join the T1D Exchange Registry and fill out their survey. That is all I ask. should take you less than 10 minutes, and it will help people with type 1 diabetes. T1DExchange.org forward slash juice box. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter. You can learn more and get started today at... You know, it's not fair. It, I'm going to say you can learn more, get started today, and then it just makes it seem like it's a website where you click on things. But this website has a ton of information on it. It's all very usable and easy to find. So let me say this. You can learn a lot more and get started today with the Contour Next One blood glucose meter at contournext.com forward slash juice box. My name is Becky. I'm 29 years old. I've been a type 1 diabetic since I was eight years old. I am a pediatric physical therapist and love my job. Um, that's about it. Nice. You have a um, <laughs> you have a late 20s vibe in your voice. Like I, I, yeah, I, it's I, not I, a good thing or a bad thing. No, no. <laughs> may I say what it is? So sure. in my mind, this is what it is. You're, see, like if I had to guess things about you just based on your voice and your delivery, I'd say that you're not married. Am I right? C close, engaged. Okay, yeah. We, listen, Becky, are you married? No. Okay. All right. So then I'm All right, right. Correct. I'm One point. I'm right about that. I would have said that you have a job where you deal with people, yeah. which you obviously do, and uh, you don't have children. Correct. Because you're just you're very calm. So you're a person who's lived oh. through the first part of their twenties. You've gotten through all that weird angsty stuff and you found your place in the world. And that's how you strike me just from the tone of your voice and your cadence. That's pretty good. Is that fair? Pretty accurate, I think. Yeah. yeah. Not bad, right? I've spoken to a lot yeah. of people, Becky. This skill really works out <laughs> nowhere but here. Like, can you imagine if I was at a party and I was like, everyone gather around, start talking. I'll tell you about your life. People be like, this yeah, jackass again. Some sort of party. weird fortune teller or something. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> this isn't a podcast. And I'd be like, I know, but it's my only skill. Um, yeah. <laughs> let's find out how you got to be this Becky. Um, ooh, sure. ooh, early on, perhaps a contender for the title of the episode. Um, how old were you when you were diagnosed? I had just turned eight. Interesting. And yeah, I I mean, at least I think I have kind of a more rare diagnosis story because I was not sick at all. Um, I just went to my general yearly checkup at my pediatrician. I think my brother and I both went. It was, you know, like our before school checkup and mm -hmm. physical and all that kind of stuff. And part of it was just peeing in a cup. So I peed in the cup and they found sugar and they said, uh, I think you should take her to a hospital right now to my mom. And my mom was like, why? <laughs> She's fine. <laughs> um, but yeah. You, you imagine that you have no expectation that there's really anything wrong with your children. You're just going because they make you go and your insurance pays for it once a year. So you might as well. And, you know, and there you go. Go to the hospital. Right. Can and we, honestly, the whole time I was in the hospital, it was 
I forget how many days, but the better part of a week, I was so confused because I was like, I feel fine. Why do they keep sticking me with needles? Like, why am I here? And we would just walk around the hospital and my mom would like point out other you know kids in wheelchairs and things. And she's like, see, like, you're so lucky. Like you're relatively healthy compared to everyone else. And I'm like, right. So get me out of here. <laughs> yeah, mom. There's literally Why nothing. am I still here? <laughs> you people are making a fairly huge mistake right now. And I would like to go. Never yeah. once sick, peed your bed, really thirsty. Nothing ever happened to you. Well, so hindsight, my mom and I have talked about this and we both like kind of saw things hindsight. Like I had, I can only remember having an accident. Like once I was kind of little or maybe like six or seven. Mm -hmm. Um, But my mom says she always brought a change of clothes with her in the car, wherever we went just in case, but it wasn't a super frequent thing and certainly not enough for either of us to think anything was weird. Um, you know, I think my mom just assumed like, oh, she's still kind of little. She probably held her pee in too long and uh, just came out. Um, but like, also. Becky, I wish your mom was here. I would like to ask her how much she pees herself. <laughs> because <Yeah. laughs> if, if, if I found myself carrying an extra set of clothes for an eight-year-old in case they peed, I'd be like, uh-oh, something's wrong with Becky. Right? Something's <laughs> yeah. weird. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but like I said, I can only remember doing it once. So. I don't think it was super duper common, but mm-hmm. obviously I think it happened more than once for her to carry a change of clothes in the car. Yeah. But, yeah. um, but I never felt sick at all. And I also, after being in the hospital for almost that week, I gained almost like five or 10 pounds just in those couple of days. So I was always just a petite little kind of twig of a kid, which my mom is only four foot 11. So Mm -hmm. it was not concerning at all, you know, because I was always small. But looking back, we were like, yeah, I think that was the diabetes. Did you grow after you got insulin? Um, I mean, a little, but (laughs) I don't think it was a a substantial growth spurt. I'm only five foot. So (laughs) oh, yeah, you didn't grow at all then. Okay, hold on a second. Yeah, (laughs) you can't take credit for growing and then tell me you're five feet tall. Uh, Does your mom have a thyroid issue? Yes. Uh huh. Do you? Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. I really almost don't need the people anymore. (laughs) Right? (laughs) I've got all the things. I've got celiac too. Yep. What what were you diagnosed with? Was was type one the first thing you were diagnosed with? Yes. Okay. How long till they got the second diagnosis? I, my thyroid was always monitored. I think even in high school, my endo would always make comments of, yeah, your thyroid's enlarged, but your numbers are fine. So we'll just keep an eye on it. And it wasn't until maybe five or six years ago that I made a comment to my endo of, I wasn't feeling well. I would just come home from school and pass out on the couch at like eight or nine o'clock, which was not my typical habit. Um, And I was just feeling super tired all the time. Do you have any recollection of when your numbers were, they were saying they were fine? Do you have any recollection of what they were? Uh, I want to say like four or five Mm -hmm. or something like that. Is that? That that makes sense. That's a spot where a lot of doctors would say it's okay. I would tell you. Yeah. I'm not a doctor. I think that's clear. Um, Mm -hmm. I think if they would have given you a thyroid replacement hormone all those years ago, you might be taller now. Dan, why would you tease something like that to me? Because <laughs> I think it's funny now that I'm saying it. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not sure, and I could be completely no. wrong, and this is 1 million percent anecdotal, okay? Yeah. But Arden was the smallest child in my town, and she is now one mm-hmm. of the tallest girls around here. Wow. And she grew uh, like a weed, as they say, after we mm-hmm. gave her thyroid replacement. And her doctor was saying the same thing. Oh, she's just a four. We'll keep watching it. And I was like, yeah. oh, no, 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 no. Because uh, I had watched my wife struggle for a number of years uh. and and get told the same thing by doctors over and over again. Your thyroid level's fine. And my wife's like, I have all the symptoms of hypothyroidism, all of them. Yeah. And they'd be like, no, no, you're fine. And they'd tell her, 
you're not active enough. You should diet better. You should exercise. Like they mm-hmm. hit her with all that. I, I you know, I, just, yeah. I, I really hate to say it, but I do believe it's true. It's all the stuff they say to women when they don't know how to help yeah. them. You know what I mean? You're gaining yep, weight. Absolutely. Be more active. Thanks. Uh, what, yeah. you, appreciate it. You know, I, I haven't had an issue with that my whole life. And now suddenly it's happening. And you think it's like, what if I, what if, what if I just stop moving? You, you know, like that's not the case. Mm-hmm. And um, so it was, it was through struggling watching my wife that we became more forceful with my daughter. And we were like, no, no, mm-hmm. you give it to her right now. And now she's, yeah, she's five, seven. Thing. Can you imagine nice, five, man. seven? Can you reach five, seven? Like put your hand up in there. I'm oh, sorry. I'm just I don't Stop. think so. <laughs> <laughs> I can't reach top cabinets of anything. Oh my so, gosh. No. Okay. So you guys, so then, so it sounds like you might've been, do you feel like you were struggling with thyroid in that time looking back and you only um, got the medication when you started passing out on the sofa? I think so. Looking back, mm-hmm. I think so, but. Yeah, I don't think it had reached the threshold for me to be thinking something was out of the ordinary. Gotcha. Do you feel better now yeah. on it than you did prior to it? Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I have I'm, way much more energy now. Yeah. And my hair was even like dry, brittle kind of thing beforehand. And mm-hmm. now it's fine. I'm I'm asking you these questions so that everyone listening who's T- T- um, I don't know, TSH is like three or they're, it's mm-hmm. two and a half, and the doctor's like, oh, we'll watch this, or four, or they're like, se- there's people running around with sevens, there's doctor's offices that won't treat till nine or 10, you know, wow. I'm just going to say, treat the symptoms, not the number. Yeah, okay. yeah, and the excuse my endo would always give me originally was, oh, well, you're not trying to get pregnant, right? So you don't really have to have it under, you know, five or six, in, really, until you're trying to get pregnant then we would be more worried about mm-hmm. it like, becky, oh, we don't care if becky okay. feels well she's not even trying to make a baby she's not even doing <laughs> yeah she's not even doing what right. she was put on the planet for yet <laughs> yeah she's not trying to procreate why would we help her <laughs> what uh, what genre of a doctor was that male or female male mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. he don't care if you feel well he just he just wants to make sure that your baby parts are ready when they need to be ready yep mm-hmm. yeah look at sure. me i'm just like typical make- Making up stuff about a person I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a pretty cool guy. I'm other sure than he is, that, other than fine. the fact that he doesn't care about you. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Yep. So, celiac when? Just two or three years ago. And I, I mean, I tell people I, I have celiac. I haven't gotten the whole endoscopy biopsy kind of thing to confirm it, but I have. I got blood work and there's two or three genetic markers that you can have. And I have all of them for celiac Mm -hmm. and I just know I get sick when I eat gluten. So, um, yeah, my GI was like, yeah, we could do the whole endoscopy. We can confirm it. I'm like, nope, I'm good. I'm just good. Not eat gluten. Thank you. I can confirm it right now with this BLT sandwich. Uh, (laughs) yeah, exactly. Like, do you want to watch me get sick? I have I'll wolf this you don't down. Have to stick anything down my throat. Yeah, I'll wolf this down, and you can stand outside of the bathroom door for the next hour and a half. How's that sound? <laughs> yep. <laughs> no tube needs to go in my mouth or in my butt for this. So, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So you don't eat uh, gluten. Correct. Do you uh, ever slip? Or no, you, you not really. To, and to be honest, I thought it would be harder in the beginning than it really is, but I remember and know very well how I feel after I eat something. So I look at a donut and I'm not like, Oh, I want it. I'm like, mm, that's going to make me feel like crap. So eh, yeah. that's all right. I'll Good for you. Any other little oddities before we move on? Do your joints hurt? Do your muscles feel sore sometimes? Do you ever have headaches? Stuff like that? No, not okay. that I can think of at least. Cool. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Well, now we got to find out how you hook this guy with three things. You got three things, and this guy is that, and you're five feet tall. Yeah. How tall is he? Look Please at that. Me. I want to. I want him to be six three so badly. How tall is your your fiance? <laughs> He's like five ten, five eleven. Oh my god, he yeah. must he must feel like seven feet tall with you. Right. Oh my god. Probably. I think it annoys him more than anything, though, because I always am like, Brandon, can you just can you reach this? Can you go get that for me? Can you? And he's like, ah, just get a stool. <laughs> like, but it's easier to ask you. <laughs> or I'll be like on the countertop, 
standing or on my knees. And he's like, get, what are you doing? Get off of there. I'm like, would you rather me ask you to get something up top? Like I'm doing it for myself. So, so you're basically standing on the counter, like a child trying to get to their cereal on Saturday morning while their parents are asleep. Absolutely. I love that. That's excellent. That's a, such a great <laughs> vision in my mind. You know, I'm five, nine and mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to tell you like, honestly, 90% of the people I meet, I'm as tall as or taller than. Wow. But when I meet someone who's taller than me, I feel like a child <laughs> because they're so much taller than I am. Yeah. You, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, well, just, yeah. Well, that's uh, one of the benefits that I thought I would have working in pediatrics, but those kids are 10 or over. It's like a 50 50 shot of. <laughs> If they're going to be taller than me or not. <laughs> so that can kind of work against me. Hey, kid, listen, we, <laughs> All need, good. we need this weight, but can you lift it and bring it over here for us? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm treating like a six foot tall football player. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> uh, here, do this. That's, like, do this. Okay. I can't show it to you with this setup, yeah. but here's how it's going to work. <laughs> No, that's no. literally how it goes a lot of the time. I, I, I like squat to something. I'm like, well, I, I didn't have to bend my knees for that, but you will have to. Mm. So you get the idea. I know I'm shifting gears here from laughing to not laughing, but, and then we're going to move mm-hmm. on. But do you, um, is it, do you, do you feel physically intimidated more in public or when you're by yourself? Is it, is it difficult to be smaller? Mm. I don't, I mean, I would say if I'm, by myself and it's other things contributing to the situation that makes me feel a little afraid or something. Like if it's, I'm walking like at night by myself in an unfamiliar place, then I start to think, you know, anyone who comes out of here, I'm physically probably not going to be able to fight off. Um, But but other than that, I don't just on a day-to-day basis. It's not in your mind. No. Okay. All right. Has anyone ever come up to you and mistaken you for a child? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> that part gets to me a little. It, it used to get to me more when I was younger in middle school or high school. People would be like, oh, are you in fifth grade? Are you in fourth grade? Like, you, Shut up. <laughs> hey, have you walked away from your mommy? Can I help you? F- oh, <laughs> never mind. She's smoking. A cigarette. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right. Yep. <laughs> All right. Those are the rest of my questions about that. Although if more pop up, I mean, let's not be surprised if it happens. But right now I'm uh I'm, I feel satiated about we know who you are. So um, what made you want to come on the podcast? Um, nothing super in particular. I don't feel like I have a radically different story or anything, you know, huge that is going to change people's lives that I share. But I just feel like every episode that I listen to and every story that gets told, I just find a couple parts of it that I either connect to or that I hadn't thought about before. So I just figured, Hey, I have diabetes. I could do that. Like maybe someone would find a part of my story kind of intriguing or they would connect to it or it would make them think about things a little differently. Well, cool. I, well, I bet, I bet that's about to happen. So yeah. you, you did send me a couple of topics that you were interested in. Um, and, yeah. and the one that, that grabbed me, uh, because I, I end up interviewing a lot of nurses for some reason is the idea mm-hmm. of being in an unpredictable workplace. Um, yeah. and so by unpredictable, I'm assuming you mean the times you eat, how active you're going to be stuff like that. Yeah. My, my eating time is less unpredictable because I have a distinct lunch time every day that I don't see patients during, but it's more the, the physical activity level. And if I'm going to be lifting toddlers or kids or doing something really physical or demonstrating a lot of exercises versus not as much standing still. Or if I have a patient on my schedule and then they don't show up and I'm anticipating that I'm going to get some activity, but then they don't show up and I'm like, Oh, do I need to adjust something to keep my numbers? So they're not going to start rising up a little bit or sometimes I'm in the pool too. I treat kids in the pool. So that can be another big factor. All right. So I guess the idea is, Becky gets up in the morning feeling a little hungry, has a big breakfast. Breakfast? What just happened? Am I having a stroke, Becky? Is this it? Oh, Uh-oh. you want me to call 911? Not yet. Let me get a I don't know where you live, but I... <laughs> Oh, my gosh. No. Okay. I think my throat just got dry for a second. Breakfast. There you go. People now are probably still hearing my accent. There's like, he's still not saying it correctly. But um, 
So you have a big meal when you wake up and you have to decide, like, am I going to be super aggressive about this or am I about to 45 minutes from now at, you know, my first patient of the day, is it going to be something super active where you're basically exercising then? Yep. Yeah. And so are you thinking about all that or do you just wing it? Every time I start to make an ad for the Contour Next One blood glucose meter, it occurs to me right before I push record just to come on and say, just go buy the meter. It's great. I know that's not much of a sales pitch, but it's true. Now, the rest of this, this is for you. Okay. This is the part because you need it because you wouldn't just listen when I said it's great. Go get it. It's fine. You need details. I understand. The Contour Next One blood glucose meter is accurate. It has second chance test strips. It fits well in your pocket, your purse, or wherever you hold your diabetes supplies. It has a bright light for nighttime viewing, a bright screen for easy reading, and if you want to connect it to an app on your smartphone, you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. This little meter does everything you want. It does the things you didn't know you wanted, and it does them accurately and efficiently. It is, in fact, the best blood glucose meter that I've used since my daughter has had type 1 diabetes. Now, if you head over to contournext.com forward slash juice box, then go to the top where it says blood glucose monitoring, you can choose the contour next one meter. Once you've done that, you'll be looking at what I'm looking at right now. Right at the top, it says free meter offer. So it's possible you'll be eligible for a free meter. Go find out. And it gives you a ton of details about the things that I tell you about all the time, about the smart light, about the accuracy, about the second chance test strip technology. It tells you about how it con it tells you about how it can connect to the contour diabetes app. It's all right there. I'm telling you this website. Listen, I'm a bit of a website snob. If I go to a bad site, I immediately, I'm like, oh, this site is annoying. I feel it right away. I always, here's what I say to my family. Did the person who designed this site ever use the internet? That's what a snob I am. I see a bad site design. I go, oh, I don't like it. it. Bothers me. This site, I am not kidding. I'm not just saying this for the ad. I love this site. Whoever made this site, genius. Go check it out. Contournext.com forward slash juice box. Don't just walk around with whatever meter somebody gave you. Make a conscious decision to use an accurate meter. There are links in the show notes and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to contournext.com forward slash juice box and all the sponsors. Some days I think about it more than others, but to be honest, most of the time I just kind of wing it. I'm I'm on the Medtronic, the 770G that has like the auto mode. So honestly, that does a fairly good job at correcting little things. You know, if I'm anticipating that I'm going to be more active and then I'm not, it tends to keep me fairly steady. But I definitely, I think about it more on days that I have a breakfast that I know is going to make me rise if I don't exercise right after, like for some reason, yogurt and fruit. And like, even if it's low sugar, like granola always makes me rise. So if I don't have a patient scheduled the first hour of the day, I eat like half the yogurt and then I wait. And then once I see the little tiny blip kind of even out, or I start to go down, like, okay, I'll finish my yogurt now. So I'll try to like only eat that when I have time to do that versus like, Oh, I have to go right in and start seeing patients. I don't want to be skyrocketing while I'm doing that. So maybe I'll eat something else instead. Is this a pretty big part of your day? Like every day? Or are there some days where it just doesn't come up, come up and there's no issue around it? There's, there's definitely some days where it doesn't come up and there's no issue. Have you ever like seen somebody who canceled at the last minute? And like the next day you're like, Hey, I had to eat a granola bar because of you yesterday. Yes. <laughs> Yep. Or I'm like, I shoveled in like 
a bunch of grapes right before because I was starting to trend down and now you don't show up and now I got a bolus. Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> Somebody, somebody's got to understand the bigger picture here. Uh, but it, re right? it really is just you. How about, um, so if I'm like the way I'm imagining it, I've been to PT before a lot of people on the floor working with a lot of different people, fairly big space, like that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, how aware are your, you know, coworkers about this? They're all very aware because I've told them, um, and I've shared with them of, Hey, you know, if I, come up to you and say like, I got to go grab something to eat. Like I might just ask you to like, keep an eye on my patient while I go run. Or I, I always keep fruit snacks, like in a little cubby, like in the gym. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all super understanding and know about it. And I've told all of them too, if we have any patients who have type one diabetes, I always say, feel free to share that, you know, I'm a type one diabetic too, just because I know with parents, it can put them at ease. Like, oh, Someone else gets it. Like they're going to be exercising, but there's someone there who who knows what to do. Yeah, one less thing for them to worry about. Um, mm -hmm. you've, have you ever run into a coworker who's looked at you like I don't care about this, Becky? But thanks for stopping by. Or everybody's been pretty receptive. I think everyone's been pretty receptive. Cool. There, there are some people more than others who will ask follow up questions or ask like. Oh, is there anything I can do? Or, you know, if they see me eating, they'll be like, Oh, are you okay? Do you need anything? And then there's others that, you know, just kind of mind their own business yeah. more. But so, so it's not um, you don't see a lack of concern, you just see like a greater level of concern from some people. Yes. Okay. Um, have you ever felt like have you ever felt it like in a bad way? Like has somebody ever like run over and grabbed something or treated you like you couldn't do something or anything like that? No, thankfully. Good. That's excellent. Excellent. Yeah. I'm assuming when they see you reaching for stuff up high, they help, but. Uh, most of the time, no, they just laugh. <laughs> <laughs> we have these extension cords that hang from the ceiling just so they're not on the floor for everyone to trip on. Mm -hmm. And it is like an inch above where I can reach. So I have to jump to get it. And one of my coworkers, she's told me, she's like, that is the best part of the day when I see you have to jump to grab that extension cord. <laughs> that girl works. She wakes up in the morning. She feels sick. And she's like, no, I've got to go to work to see, yeah. to see if I try to get that cord. I, I can't not go. I, in my mind, yeah. I have you like you're like 97 pounds. And I like <laughs> I just see you. Like, it's not too far off. Yeah. I, I just see you bouncing up and down like, ah almost got it that time like I, I, uh, yeah. I imagine sometimes when you jump up you float for a second because you're so tiny and then it just it's just a sadness when your fingers don't hit the thing and you come back down uh, yeah or my fingers hit it but i don't hit, quite grab it and then it's on the swing and then oh um, yeah do you still have that feeling when you thing. jump like i'm so high right now like do you ever play <laughs> you know what i mean like I, i've play, played basketball with guys who are like, yeah. they go up and they're like, ah, and you think back and you're like, they were three inches off the ground. <laughs> they, they can't <laughs> jump at all. Yeah, I guess so. Maybe not uh, normally, but if I'm on a trampoline or something, I do. <laughs> it's happening. I'm like, over, I'm flying. I'm over seven feet in the air. <laughs> yeah, this is what it looks like. <laughs> Becky, you're my favorite person today so far. I, I, I want to be clear that I've only spoken to a dog uh, so far today, but. As All you, right, as the bar you, is low. No, but, you're starting okay. strong, though. I mean, I'm going to see other people as the day goes on, and they're going to have to clear this bar right now. So, All right, let said, me know the final ranking. You've said it high. You've <laughs> said it very high. Do you have any anxiety at work about getting low? Like, how does it feel internally? A little bit. Um, it's more so I treat some kids who have some pretty significant medical involvements or developmental delays and some kids who – you know, maybe all we're working on is head control and they need like full support for everything else. So it's when I go into treat a kid like that, that it makes me a little more anxious. And I might, even if I'm maybe steady at like 90, I'll just like, all right, maybe let me eat like just five carbs just to make sure. Cause I don't want to dip down low while I'm trying to handle this patient and their safety is at risk. If I have to stop, you know, and go eat something or if, you know, I have to tell their parent, like, oh, you know what? Can you come hold them? I just got to go eat something real quick. You know, I just, well, I'm following. I, I yeah. feel like it's, yeah. And rather than with maybe a, a teenager who we're working on more sports specific stuff, I can 
kind of snack on something if I really need to while I'm telling them what to do. I feel like it's less of a big deal than maybe more of the medically complex kids who I feel need my full attention for usually an hour. So kind of in the back of your mind, if if the patient isn't able to, because of uh, conditions or age, really mm-hmm. defend their own safety, if you should just plop over that that mm-hmm. actually sticks in your head. Like I can't I can't pass out here yeah. or have to run away here because I, I have an eleven month old kid on a table. Right. Gotcha. Do the are the parents close by while you're working on them or do they wait somewhere else? It depends on whatever they prefer. Most of the time, especially if it's a younger kid, they are right there. Um, we have separate treatment rooms, like with a closed door, and then we have a big open gym too. So usually the younger kids be taken to a room and usually the parent is sitting right there and involved in the session. Can you give me some examples of why kids would see you? Sure. Um, younger kids, especially babies, I see a lot for something called torticollis. It's where they hold their head kind of sideways because a muscle in their neck is tight. I see a lot of younger kids, they just call it developmental delay. So maybe they don't sit up on time. Maybe they're having trouble walking. I see a lot of kids with something called cerebral palsy. Mm -hmm. Um, It's essentially like a a brain injury from birth. um, It can be a huge variation of their functional level. You know, they could walk, but maybe just need braces for support. And I help them to get braces and, you know, learn to walk or, they could be totally dependent and kind of wheelchair bound. And we're just working on, you know, I'm supporting them, but they're working on their head control so that, you know, mom or dad can brush their teeth a little bit better without worrying about their head kind of flailing about. Um, and then I also see kids who maybe have knee pain because they, you know, run track and they got hurt or something like that, or just had surgery for their ACL that got torn or what's that. Um, knee? There's like a that. knee thing that happens to kids. A lot. Yeah. I, uh, Osgood Slaughters. Is yes, that what you're thinking? That, say it again. Yeah. Because I, I, I spoke over you. <laughs> Osgood Slaughters. Yeah. Funny name. They can't just call yeah. it knee pain. They got to call it that. Um, I know, right? It's common. essentially just because they're growing. <laughs> right. And they're trying to be incredibly active at the same time, yes. right? And then their knee hurts yep. like hell. Yep. And what do exactly. you do? And usually you. I usually just show them how to stretch because usually the muscle is super tight and I tell them to calm down on the activity for a week or two. And 90% of the time that kind of takes care of it. No kidding. Do you see um, any like really like, like ligament tear stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. What, yep. what is, yeah. I see them like in ankles, knees. Yeah. Um, shoulders, baseball players. Yes. Less common tears or surgeries in shoulders, but more shoulder or elbow pain in mm. baseball. Yeah. It, what's it called when their scapula starts to kind of drift away from their back? Does it have Oh, yeah. Like winging. Yeah. It's creepy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. At one point when my son was like 14, you could reach behind his scapula and like pinch it like it was a, yeah. like a piece of bread. If that makes sense. Yep. Anybody, if people are like, you could put fingers behind it and then with your thumb on the outside, just grab a hold of it. Um, yes. because he was throwing so sense. hard for his age and, oh. and then the doctor's like, Hey, easy, <laughs> let your, yeah. body, let your body catch up. It's interesting because right. you're just, you're creating whip or, or force in a way that your body's not designed to do it because you're so small. Mm-hmm. Like you just like, yeah. like athletic kids can put themselves in weird contorted positions to create this, this whip, you know, and it's, yeah. it's, it's tough on their body. Um, Absolutely. Especially nowadays that I just feel like sports have become so much more intense and you almost have to be on a travel team or multiple teams to like be considered good and feel like hardly any kids play just to have fun anymore. Yeah. And it's hard to get the point across of it's too much on their little bodies to be doing this seven days a week or even six days a week at the level that they're doing it. Are they all doing it? The the one some amazing, I'm a, I'm not asking you to put yourself in the position of every person, but you meet mm-hmm. people, I guess. And do they talk about it? Like I want to play in college. Does that, is that what they think they're doing? Or do you think some of them are trying to win like some 11 year old trophy or something like that? Yeah. I, I think more often the older kind of high school age kids are more looking towards college um, and like playing in there and being actually successful in their sport. But just anecdotally, 
from the younger kids who are pushing themselves hard. It seems like parent motivation is really big. Like they, the child, again, I, I've not been in their position, so I can't say a hundred percent, but it almost seems like, oh, well, my mom thinks I'm, you know, really successful and good at this. So I'm going to do that because she's going to keep telling me that I'm doing good. Yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah, I um I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but for just everyone listening for your edification, most of your children suck. Um, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we try to find nice ways of saying that. <laughs> we'll, we'll say like, are they a baseball player or do they play baseball? <laughs> <laughs> and, and no one knows the difference. And by the way, fairness, it, it, um, there's a moment where nobody knows. You know, you're just, yeah. you're, you're judging against what's around you. It isn't mm-hmm. really until you kind of open your circle up and meet more and more people from farther and farther away until you can say, Oh wow. Like that kid's really, really way better than my son or daughter. Yeah. Like there's, or, Very true. or their size becomes an issue in some sports. Like I'm thinking of these two people. They're lovely. Hold on a second. Clear my throat. <clears> throat> mm-hmm. Sorry. These two lovely people. They're, they're like, you could probably beat up the mom, right? Like that's how mm-hmm. tiny they are. And, um, oh my gosh, hold on a second. <clears throat> Remember earlier when breakfast, the word breakfast got stuck. <clears throat> now everything's yeah. stuck. All right, hold on a second. This is, gonna get, this is probably going to edit it out. Edit it out. Turn your head away. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, sorry. So these, these, there are these two people. They're very tiny. And they have a son playing baseball. Mm-hmm. And I mean, from an early age, this kid's trying to hit and the mom, not even the dad, the mom is behind home plate, right behind the the, the fence, talking mm-hmm. to him in between pitches. Oh, you need to do this. Get your arm up. Like, ha- and I'm just watching. I'm like, oh, well, this isn't going to go well. Like, you know, the kid strikes out masterfully because hitting a baseball is really difficult. And now there's somebody talking to him in between the pitches, trying to like make adjustments on the fly during the game, which if anyone's listening, when you get to the game, you just got to let them hit. If they don't do well, you work on it later. Anyway. um, Right. These people were just for years. My son's going to do this. He's going to do that. He's so good. Blah, blah, blah. And I kept looking at them and thinking you're five feet tall and your husband is five, three. Like, what is it you (laughs) think is about to happen? You, you know, like, right. like, and and then the kid grew, you know, to five five at his full height. Like, these are tiny Ooh. people. There's nothing wrong. Like, he's 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 actually outshined them pretty well. Like, you know, what I mean? uh, yeah, I was gonna say, I'm impressed. If I'm him, I look back. I'm pretty. I'm like, oh, oh, I did it. You know, um, yeah, he's gonna do this. It's gonna be great. He's gonna be amazing. And I just kept thinking, like, when you turn on college baseball, professional baseball, you see any five five kids. And then people would run around going, Dustin Pedroia. And I'm like, he's the one guy. It, he's the guy. <laughs> the exception. <laughs> There's one of them. It's him. And then later it was uh, Jose Altuve, right? Like, oh, look how – I'm like, okay, well, he's the next one guy. There's only one guy <laughs> at a time. Your kid's already 15. Right. By the time the next guy comes, your son's going to be that age. It's not going to be him. Or, or if it is, well, it's just going to happen anyway. You know, right. you don't think Jose Altuve was always great at baseball, just short, you, you, you know, and, and like that that kind of feeling. But they get so uh, they get wrapped up in it. And they're and yeah, and I do see I mean, I have seen a lot of kids get hurt over the years um, trying to keep up with something that just they could have done for fun. And it would have been amazing. Right. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Yeah. They could have just they could have just. All right, tell people it's going to put you out of business, but like, right? It's six days a week is too much to be throwing a baseball when you're 11. Yes, yeah. 100%. Okay. Yep, too much. What Back a, down. What are some of the other activities that really beat the hell out of kids? Gymnastics is a huge one. Um, I think, again, because it's usually at a pretty high intense level and you're contorting your body in all these crazy positions that if you don't, have the underlying flexibility for it, you're going to get a little hurt. Mm -hmm. Um, And we see a lot of soccer players too, just with knee pain in general. That's where we see a lot of like the knee ligament tears from, unfortunately, and a lot of concussions. Mm. All that for a sport that it's a success if nobody scores. 
<laughs> breaking your kid's knee for a zero zero tie. Yep. It's basically misdirected track and field. <laughs> right? I, I know soccer people are so mad if I say that. By the way, I, I love Ted Lasso, so just let it go. Okay. It's a great show. Oh good. Uh, but <laughs> it is a good show. Yeah, but fun. soccer to me looks like it looks like somebody shook up a bunch of people and dropped them on a field and was like, run. <laughs> they all just kind of, yeah. I know it's not that, but Go. it's how it occurs to me anyway. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, that that's enough. I, I really don't mean to, I'm not coming down on people. I'm just saying I've, my children are older now and, um, you know, I've seen them do these things and, you know, just keep in mind that, you know, Arden was a, a, a legitimately, uh, kind of astonishing third baseman in softball. And, mm-hmm. One day her shoulder hurt and she doesn't play softball anymore. And mm. and she, as she got older, she's like, it's okay. I didn't really want to play in college anyway. And that was the end of it. Mm. Like, so. Right. Which is perfectly fine. Yeah. yeah. I, I think she learned a lot from playing softball. I think there were a lot of, uh, I think there are a lot of lessons about following through and working hard and not giving up. And I, I, I'll tell you, there's a lot that comes from losing. Losing so important mm-hmm. for kids. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't know how many people think that's true but um it really makes yeah, I definitely something, agree. yeah when something works out it really makes it valuable so all right so mm-hmm. uh i mean how does diabetes go for you how long have you been on an uh, on the medtronic uh how does that pump work by the way the one you're on the the way that i'm using it it's in the it's called auto mode so that's the algorithm part of it um so it gives like tiny little mini boluses, I guess, every five minutes, depending on what your blood sugar is, what it's been doing in the past, what it's projecting that it's going to do. Um, So theoretically, if I go a day and not eating anything, it'll keep me, I I adjusted the target for between like 80 and 110, Mm -hmm. 80 and 120, I think. So theoretically, it'll keep me within that range. Uh, without me having to touch it or do anything. Does that work? Uh, I've never gone a whole day without eating. So, <laughs> I don't, but yeah, for, for the majority of the time it works for me. I have a pretty crazy, I don't know. I think it's like a mix of dawn phenomenon and foot on the floor. So I always in the morning first thing, because when you're in auto mode, the only way to give a bolus is to enter a blood sugar, like a correction or carbs, you just can't like, Hey, I'm going to give a unit. So I have to exit out of like the algorithm and I just push a button. And then I put in usually like anywhere between half a unit and a unit and a half. Um, okay. And then I go back into the algorithm. I'm like, all right, here we go. Because if I don't do that, I'll usually shoot up to like 160 or even more if I don't do anything. And the algorithm will take it down, but it takes like an hour or two sometimes. So mm-hmm. I don't, have the time for that yeah what what um you said in your note that you want to talk about the different sensors have you worn a dexcom before because you don't wear one with the with the medtronic you have to use their sensor yes yes so the first cgm i got was a dexcom i forget i think it might have been the three or mm. four maybe there was a four a five a six and then the seven's coming out and there was a okay seven, so it's probably the four somewhere yeah yeah the four. So you had like the very first kind of generation of it. Yes. I was on that with an animus pump. Um, and I liked it. It was fine. I don't know. I was still, I guess I was at the point where I really wasn't paying attention. Th- yeah. Paying attention. Yeah. Right. Like it would just go off and I'd be 200 after a meal. I'm like, yeah, fine. Were That's you like in your early 20s? That's supposed to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. College. And I was in grad school for, grad school. for physical therapy. So I was like, I got I got other things to worry about. I'm, it's fine. Yeah. That's a tough major, um, isn't it? There's a lot of, I mean, a lot of science in a physical therapy, even undergrad. Yeah. Yeah. I had to major in science in, in undergrad. And then, yeah, I did a combined program. So I did three years of undergrad and then three years of grad school and hmm. came out with a doctorate. Yeah. Oh. Congratulations. Yeah. It's a big. Oh, why? Thank you. I, uh, my daughter's uh, a senior in co- uh, high school right now. And, you know, every third friend of hers is like, I'm going to be a physical therapist. I'm like, you know, I don't know if we need all of them. Like you guys are like, right. and then they get there and th- then a lot of them, 
they, they get their first couple science tests and they're like, oh, I'm not going to be a physical therapist. Yep. Oh, not for me. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of work. Does that I mean, for me, it was definitely worth it. Yeah. Yeah, you for see, sure. See a lot of people go. Um, even. Sorry, go ahead. No, no. Do you see a lot of people drop the courses? Yeah. Um, in undergrad, we, I, no, no, sorry. In grad school, I started with the class. I think we were 60 five or so and I think we graduated like in the 50 number like 55 58 or so of us which isn't huge but also like you're in a graduate school program so you would think if you're in that that, if you made it that far like you're gonna stick but even there were a lot of people yeah just once the courses got to anatomy and dissections and stuff they were like nope just kidding. This is actually not, <laughs> not what I want. I, I'm going to do something different now. Like, I don't, how do you switch streams in grad school? <gasps> right. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, there are people that do it, but it sounds tough to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I, oh my gosh. Um, well, I, I just, I've heard it's a difficult major and, uh, yeah. And for some reason it, 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 it attracts a lot of high school graduates, the idea that they're going to be able to, I, do you think mm-hmm. it seems like, a like, what did you think of it when you were, when you started doing it? Like, what was it that attracted you to it? I always wanted to work with kids in some way. I thought I wanted to be a teacher all growing up, but then I actually went to physical therapy because I had some ankle pain and I was like, Oh, this is pretty cool. Like they can make people feel better. And then I was like, Oh, I wonder if I could do that for kids. And mm. I ended up volunteering at, it, it was kind of, like a long-term care facility for um, pretty medically complex kids. And I volunteered with a PT there to kind of help her out with things. And yeah, that's just kind of where it, it stuck. So I kind of went in with a very like focused of, okay, I want to work with kids. I want to work with this population rather than just, and you did I don't it. know. Yeah. How, how was, yeah. how was growing up with type one? Like, did you, was it one of those things where your parents were real involved and it all kind of went well, or did you do it on your own and it was a mess or how was it? My mom was pretty involved. She was the main one who kind of took care of me. Um, I, I would say I never really went through the phase of where I was quote unquote, like ignoring it and not taking care of it at all. Like, I think my highest A1C ever was maybe like in the high sevens or low eights. I mean, there's definitely times where I could have been paying a lot more attention to it and where I was kind of on that roller coaster of up and down a lot. Um, but all in all, I feel like it it was never the primary focus of my life. Like I always had other things that, you know, I was in school, I did gymnastics, I did this, I loved doing art. And my I think my parents made a big deal about those being like the defining things about me and what to focus on. And it's like, Oh yeah, by the way, you have diabetes, but we're taking care of it. Like as long as you take care of it, it'll be all good. Mm -hmm. How are your outcomes Um, now as an adult and where the, and how were they in college? um, In college, it, it was fine. I didn't have a CGM in college. And I think if I did, I would have been a lot better at it, but I still tested like before every meal, like first thing in the morning, last thing before I went to bed through all through college. And again, I had like more of that roller coaster kind of thing going on, I think, but um, never had any like crazy dangerous lows or never was, at least I don't think I was ever close to like DKA or anything like that. Um, So yeah, I feel like I was fairly, I definitely could have been better, but fairly well managed. And now my, I just uploaded my data and like did it and like calculated my estimated A1C. And I've been doing that for the past couple months just to keep a check on it. And it's always been like in the high fives or like 6.1, 6.2 at the highest. So I, I'm I like, pretty happy with that. Yeah. I like asking people that because it's interesting how your perspective changes. Like when you talk mm-hmm. about college and it's so different than how you are now, but it still seems. Okay. Yeah. You know, be, but like you I, I go back to that. If I said to you right now, go back to the way you used to do it in college, you'd say. Yeah, absolutely not. Right. No, I'm good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. And even now, I, although I spend way more mental energy on it now and in the past couple of years, I think it's way worth it to be so stable and 
you know, not feeling the ups and downs. And I think it's a good trade off of like giving a little bit more mental energy, but getting a lot from it instead of just kind of like, no, I'm just, it's fine. I'm doing what I can. It's good enough. Yeah. How long have you been listening to the podcast? Probably a little over a year, maybe. Um, it kind of prompted me because my A1C, like maybe up until two years ago or so, or a year ago was, you know, kind of hovering like in the high sixes, low sevens. And my endo was, you know, just kind of like, you know, I, you're a smart girl. Like, I think you could do better than this. And again, the baby thing, he's very focused on this. He's like, if you want to get pregnant, you know, you should be like under 6.5. Like, you know, I, I think you can do this. I'm like, all right, I guess I can like, let's see. So I, I just, I had been listening to other podcasts just for entertainment. I was like, I wonder if there's any diabetic podcasts out there. Um, yeah. And then I found yours and discovered, I mean, it sounds so silly because I've known it all along, but again, I just guess I've never given the mental energy to it, but you know, like the simple concept of pre bolus, I was like, okay, yeah, I pre bolus. It was 10 minutes because that's what I was told to do. And my sugars would usually get to close to 200 and then come back down. But my diabetic educator was like, yeah, that's going to happen. It's fine. But no, it doesn't have to happen. So, you know, after listening to you, I was like, oh, yeah, let me figure out what my actual pre bolus time is and if I can avoid that rise. And yeah, it's more like half an hour for me. It's a long time. Um, so I've even just from that one simple thing, I think that has hugely contributed to lowering my A1C so much. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I've, listen, I, I say it out loud and I don't know if I'm right, but I think you pre bowl as well. You lose a point off your A1C. Yeah. It's, it's just, Oh, definitely. It's, it, you know, it's just what I've seen. Again, it's anecdotal. I, I could be a hundred percent wrong. Like it could be more, it could be less. I don't know. Um, how, uh, easy or difficult was it to put the stuff you heard in the podcast into effect while you were using the Medtronic with the auto mode? Did that mm-hmm. present any problems for you? I don't think so. I think there were just certain things, you know, like when I would hear tips about the basil and things like that, that I, I wouldn't totally ignore, but I would just think like, all right, if I'm in manual mode for whatever reason, like that's a good idea. I can, I can put that into effect, but otherwise, you know, that doesn't really pertain to me. So I would just kind of take like the bits and pieces that pertain to more like the pre bolusing and, you know, how different, you know, I don't always go by like the exact carb count on something anymore because I realize like, oh, well, yeah, that can be a starting point. But if I'm, you know, eating pancakes, I'm going to have to bolus for more carbs than is actually there. And that's okay. Just because that's how it hits me. That's how pancakes Um, do. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Even gluten-free ones. (laughs) Isn't it funny? Like I, I've had this experience where I had to eat gluten-free for 30 days for like a medical thing that ended up being not a medical Mm -hmm. thing. And I was like, oh, I, I miss gluten for 30 days for nothing. But um, yeah. oh. I, I, I commingled in my head gluten-free with healthier. And then yeah. and no. then I started gaining weight. I was like, wait a minute. So this stuff's not healthier. It just doesn't have gluten. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I don't know why. But there's such that. the image that it is. Yeah. yeah. No, I just thought, oh, well, this this food obviously will be less impactful on my, my overall health because it's gluten-free. And I was like, Kelly's oh. like, are you eating more? And I'm like, I don't think so. It's all this great <laughs> gluten-free food. Uh, but well, that's good to know. But I, I was one thing that stood out. What you said was, you think your pre bowl times like a half an hour. Do you think that's because of the algorithm a little bit? I think so because as soon as I bolus for carbs, if I'm at a good number, it'll take away the little auto boluses because it thinks like I just ate and there's a ton of insulin. So I guess. And so you start um, drifting if you don't pre bolus long enough, you drift up before the bolus can start working. Yes, gotcha. exactly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you? Sorry, <laughs> that, was me, that was me being stupid because I couldn't think of my next question. I was like, <laughs> I'll just try to distract from the fact that I don't have a follow up to this. <laughs> All good. <laughs> yeah. how, how do your um? So this thing, it's making small boluses, so it doesn't change your basal mm-hmm. to try to impact your blood sugar at all. It just it just does the the boluses. Yeah. I mean, it, it separates it out, I guess, like it 
if I'm looking at the data, it'll still, it'll say like total basal amount that was given for the day, because I guess it tallies up like the little microboluses that it's been given. But yeah, it's not ever like a set rate or anything. It's just constantly, I guess, adjusting it depending on what my blood sugar is doing so at that time. I might be confused. So are the tiny little boluses, are they boluses or is it just increasing your basal insulin and decreasing your basal insulin? Or is it making, or is it doing both? Like I don't have a set basal amount that it goes off of, if that makes it any more clear. So like I can look at the amount of like quote unquote bolus that it's giving every five minutes and it's usually like 0.1, 0.2, something like that. I see. Real small. So I I guess if you like total them all up in 24 hours, I can see like, oh, it gave me 20 units of like quote unquote basal. But I mean, it'll do that. Like if it sees me trending up, you know, it'll give more. Yeah. If it sees me trending down, it'll stop. Or things like that. I don't know if that made it more or less confusing. Uh, I, I I have to say something. I kind of like that you don't really know 100%. I like that. It, <laughs> I, I like that it works from you. Right. Yeah. And I, yeah. I like that you don't know it like the back of your hand and it's working for you. Yep. I think that's great. Yep. I, I think that all these algorithms and, need to be like that eventually. Yeah, definitely. And to be to be honest, that's like kind of my personality anyway, which kind of fits like, I don't have the time, nor do I want to spend the time to get to know how this works in the nitty gritty. And to be honest, if someone told me about it, I'd be like, oh, all right. And then I would forget about it probably three <laughs> hours later and be like, if someone asked me to repeat it, I'd be like, I don't you go talk to them. I, yeah. don't. Well, I, mean, even <laughs> I though, don't know. Even though you're 29, you've had diabetes for you know two thirds of your life. So, mm -hmm. you know, over 20 years, it sounds like to me. And yep. so you've got like, just there's an ease about it for you, right? Like you don't, do you not mm -hmm. think about it very often that you have diabetes? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, which I like, and I hope it stays that way because again, I have much more imp important things that I want to be thinking about in my life mm -hmm. rather than diabetes. And I feel like I'm always going to give it the amount that it needs to keep me healthy, but I don't want to be thinking about it every 10 minutes of my life and yeah. that would I'm not an anxious person but that makes me anxious thinking about thinking about it that long <laughs> yeah, I understand. hey so are you going to fulfill your destiny as far as your doctor's concerned and make babies or do you not a, a baby person do you think oh a question my mother would love me to answer because I have my guess already from talking to um, yeah eventually yeah we're not ready right now but yeah. eventually eventually I think you're getting a dog when you get married maybe <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. We've talked about that too. And we're like, mm, not quite yet. We yeah. want to tra travel and do some fun things that we don't have to have a lot of obligations towards. But yeah. So that boy you found, he's he's on board like with a let's just do our jobs and enjoy ourselves and we're not starting a family right away. He's He feels the same way? Yes, definitely. Oh yeah, he gets like a physical reaction if I ever bring up like a family or kids and he's like huh, what no ah stop talking about it we not yet that. right stop it also where would it go inside <laughs> of you when we made it like you're <laughs> i mean <honestly>. yes yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> um uh, what was i gonna say is he older or younger than you he's a year older mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That was my guess yeah. i'm gonna start writing my guesses there's no way for me to prove it Ooh. to anybody but it, it yeah. i'm not really gonna do it but uh you meet him in grad school or at work uh, funny, we've actually known each other since we were toddlers. We grew up at the same church together, and we were always like in Sunday school class and all that kind of stuff together. We never really talked. Um, we were both kind of shy kids anyway and just kind of kept to ourselves. But we went to separate high schools, separate colleges, and we kind of connected back after he had graduated from college. I was done undergrad and in grad school. And we went to this like church lunch that was, you know, recent college graduates come and talk to the kids who are seniors in high school and going off to college, give them advice, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And funny because both of us had said later, we're like, yeah, we did not want to go to that, but our mothers forced us to. And we're like, oh, thanks, mom. Thanks for forcing us to go to that. Because I, yeah, we reconnected and 
Yeah. That was that. I, I almost couldn't follow what you're saying because in my mind, I had an eight-year-old boy hitting on a seven-year-old girl with the line, <laughs> so what do you think of this Pontius Pilate guy? You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly how it crazy went. Yes. story, right? And you're like, wait, what's <laughs> happening? Like, I, how do kids like? I, I just, I don't know. It just, I commingled the whole thing together in my mind. Like, you were dating when you were in, Sorry. in my head, and I was like, what do you talk about in Sunday school? Like, to get a girl's attention. You know what I mean? Like, do you run up to her? And you pull recite her? the prayer. And, yeah. Ooh, like, I'm real impressed. Check, check this out. I know. I know the first three sentences of the Our Father. I'm going to hit you with it right now. Uh, yeah. You're all like swooning. You're like, wow, he's on top of things. You, you pull it, or do I like run up and pull your pigtail and yell like this is what the devil would do? <laughs> like, yeah. and, you're, and you're like, I like a bad boy. Like at seven, that's what you're thinking, <laughs> you know? Um, I, yeah. I just, yeah. I was like, that's fast. Oh, so you guys did a thing, didn't really know each other, went to school together. Yeah. Probably were gonna drift apart, but then yeah. your moms made you go to like. So your mom was like, uh oh, this girl's not getting married. So she made you go to this thing. <laughs> is that what happened? You think? <laughs> I'm not sure the thought process behind it, but maybe. Yeah, that's what she was thinking. She's like, I need a grandchild. This girl seems like she's dawdling. She went to school, right? and grad school, and oh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh-uh. We well, gotta was, sell her down. Well, that was nice of your mom to set you up with a sexual partner. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for putting it that way. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. I thought that would be helpful when we were talking. Yeah, uh, sorry. That's, that's lovely. <laughs> I don't want to. I, I now I'm scared that I'm going to ruin your next uh, encounter with your. You're going to get jump in bed. No. Like, oh my god, my mom pimped me out to you at a church. <laughs> this whole thing is wrong. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, his mom was doing never going to see it the same again. <laughs> yeah, his mom was doing the same thing. He's like, oh, this kid. Absolutely. Yeah, that's very nice. Do you live in like um uh, the like what what region in the country do you live in? Uh, the Northeast. Really? Like, yeah. Well, mid northeast, I guess. I think we live in the same kind of area. You and I live in the same area. I think so. Yeah. Wow, it's interesting. I don't <laughs> know why I find that interesting. I must think that everyone around me is a heathen, and no one goes to church. <laughs> like, oh, I maybe. That, I yeah. do think that's my. That, I was like, oh, there aren't people who go to church around here, are there? <laughs> <laughs> she must be in the center of the oh, U.S. <laughs> I thought for certain you were calling me from a cornfield right now when you said that. <laughs> no, no, just yeah. my basement in the suburbs. That's all. <laughs> no kidding. I, I am. I hope people understand when they're listening that my generalizations about the entire world are mostly wrong. Like I'm good at the like drill down <laughs> stuff. Like you know, you're a kind person. I can kind of tell your age from that. Like that little stuff. But then you know, <laughs> the minute you yell church, I'm like, oh, well. I I've now have it narrowed down to six states that she must live in. You know, Kansas is right. very high on my list. And and I also start getting like a flutter in my chest because if you listen to the podcast enough, you know that there are just so many Mormons that come on this podcast for some yeah. reason, right? So I'm like, oh, yes. but, how, but that didn't jive because you don't want to have kids right away yeah. or at all. I'm right. thinking you don't want to have them at all, by the way, Becky, but that's what, you know, it's your I, also, I, I do you. someday, I think someday, but, you know, we'll talk in five years and see <laughs> Yeah, when you start doing the math when you're 35 and you're like, wait a minute, so I'm going to be 55 and that kid gets out of high school. Eh, why don't we just get a fish tank? <laughs> right. I have a nephew. He is delightful. So Same we'll, thing, that's, really. that's good for now. Yeah. Yep. Or those kids. I mean, you do put a lot of effort into children at your job, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Is that kind of a job? Is there uh, is there growth in that job or, or is this the kind of job that when you're 40, you'll be doing similar things? It's funny. Cause my fiance and I talk about that a lot because he is, um, in like the much more the business world, like in the media kind of industry mm-hmm. and he's climbing the ladder, you know, yeah. and he's always like looking for his next promotion and all that. And, uh, I mean, mine, I could have growth. Like I, could you know go for supervisor positions and things like that but they always come with a cut in your caseload so you know okay you'll treat patients 50 percent of the time and do you know other supervisor manager stuff 50 percent of the time and at least right now i'm not interested in that so you know i take like continuing education courses and learn you know new treatment ideas and things like that but yeah i would be 100 happy if you know, 20 years from now, I am 
quote oh, unquote, like the same job. title. Like yeah. I'm a physical therapist. Oh, that's excellent. I've achieved that. That's good. I'm, it's, it's nice to hear somebody who loves what they're doing and, uh, isn't constantly like, I'm not coming down on your husband. Um, and mm-hmm. the other day I said to my wife, I was like, Hey, how long are you going to keep this position you're in right now? Like, when are we going to like, yeah. you know, turn it into mm-hmm. something else? And that is a way some people think. Um, yeah, but it's, it's interesting to hear people not think that way. Um, mm-hmm. yeah, it was totally foreign to him when we were talking about it for the first time, because they think he was asking them, Oh yeah, is there a, you know, what do you, what's your next goal? What's your career goal? And I'm like, I'm in it, buddy. Like, what do you, what do you mean? I'm doing this Just because uh, yeah. what's that? I'm doing this. Then we're hanging out and that's yeah. that baby. <laughs> right. Exactly. And he's like, what do you mean? Like I got a whole ladder to climb. I've got my next 10 years and planned out and my goal and all this. And uh, yeah, it's just a very different world and both of them are fine. But yeah, my, to him, it was very foreign. I was like, what do you mean? You're done. <laughs> yeah. My wife tells the story of, um, <clears throat> She's like, she's like this, this person comes in to me. She overso- used to oversee a lot of people at one of her jobs. And she said she came in. It was like the end of a probation period. The, you know, just the, the person had just gotten the job. And uh, mm-hmm. yeah, you come in to talk about how the first three months go. And the girl sits down. And she's young, like out of college. And she says, am I getting a raise? And my wife goes, you've only been here for three months. Mm-hmm. And she goes, yeah, but I've never been late. And my, my wife says, that's one of our really basic desires for you here at the job. You understand, right? Like, we, we do want you to come every day and be on time. And uh, right. that's not an accomplishment. That just that We just need that to happen. <laughs> she said, you don't even understand this job yet. Like, this job takes six, nine months a year to really understand like you, yeah. like you're like, she's like, at this moment, you really, you're, you're almost not, like not a value to us yet. Like we're still training you. And, um, she's like, I'm not getting a raise. She's like, no, my wife said she went and looked for another job and left. What? She had not I mean, gotten far luck. enough up All the right. ladder in 90 days of being a, a, a person. My wife also says that one time she was interviewing a, a young girl out of college and she said the girl was, you know, she just, she was like very sure of herself but then mm-hmm. all of the sudden something came up a question came up and she's like oh i don't know i'd have to ask my mom and and, mm-hmm. Kelly, and kelly's like oh okay and she goes she's outside waiting for me do you want to know now <laughs> my, wife, <gasps> oh, gosh. my wife goes you brought your mom to your job uh, th- this you brought, th- this is like you came to try to get a job and your your mom's with you she's like yeah wow. and my wife's like writing down notes red flag like, yeah. yeah came with her mommy <laughs> to the interview <laughs> like you know like and at the same time you're like wow that's interesting my mom has never gone anywhere with me i i like i once left the house and i said i think i'm losing my sight <laughs> she was like good luck <laughs> yeah <laughs> you'll figure it out yeah. oh wow that sounds crazy i'll see you later or maybe you won't <laughs> see me though and you know like it was just like she's like, i'll go with you no nothing like i you know i'm old now but um that that's really interesting you're yeah. not really i like your age right now like you're just on the yeah, right side of uh of your generation i think yeah i oh. think so too yeah right. so any other stuff that you want to tell people with diabetes are you a lush do you know how to drink really well with it or is there any other stuff that you might want to <laughs> <laughs> i mean i drink but uh nothing too crazy yeah what, um, what's the key what's that what's the key to not getting low when you're drinking um i mean I never have gotten super low after drinking. I usually, you know, cause it's usually later at night when you're drinking. So I usually just do eat probably like 10 carbs before I go to bed, unless my sugar's already like 150 or more. Then I'm like, all right. Um, but also in my pump, I have like a temporary target that I can set of like 150. Yeah. So I'll often do that uh, on nights that I have like more than one or two drinks just to make sure I'm not going to dip real low. There's part of me that wants to name this episode. She just works out for Becky. <laughs> <laughs> it just goes. I don't know. <laughs> You're like, I don't know. I do my I thing. I don't know what to tell you. It all works out fine. I bend a couple kids' knees. I roll around. Yep. It's good. <laughs> like, That's pretty much it. I, I People love... are going to listen to this and be like, she sucks. She didn't give me anything no, that I can use. <laughs> no, I see. I, I disagree. I think that your attitude is the thing you bring to this. Mm. I really do. Like you were yeah. just, you're just like, yeah, I figured it out. Like I did better. Like somebody told me to do better. I did better. 
Um, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know, like at your college, like I tested before I ate and before I went to bed and when I got up in the morning, you're like, that's it. I don't know. (laughs) Even even when you said you're like, (laughs) I was never in DKA or close to it. And then you paused and you went, I I don't think. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I think. (laughs) Oh my God. I just, I, so, so there's something about like, so there's, look, I'm not going to tell you that people should run around with that like it'll be all right like i don't think that Mm -hmm. i think that something about how you grew up with diabetes you're learning stuff along the way you obviously know a lot about it you're doing well for yourself and 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 so it kind of comes together slowly but not in a way that you can pinpoint you can't really point to something and go oh there's this thing i do and this is definitely the reason why so i I like you're right and I, i like that idea and i like it for people who are diagnosed now who maybe are listening and like, oh, there's so many like things I need to know. Like there is, but you, you don't get to know them all on the first day. And yeah, so, that's very true. Yeah. So when and you're I'm, not always spending like so much of your energy on it either. Like there is a point where it just where you're living. becomes second nature. Yeah. 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 I, so I, I guess my point is like when I'm telling people, look, you got to get your basil right, learn to pre bolus, figure out the different impacts of food, stay flexible, I should say, and take a little bit of Becky and just Stir it in there a little bit. I'm, I'm being sprinkle serious. it on top. I, I'm I'm being serious, like a little bit of Becky. Yeah, yeah. That's the like title it. of the episode. I'm I not, like it. I'm getting that. It's I'm actually good. I'm writing that down a little bit. Yes, Becky. <laughs> That's it. That's the name of this episode um, because a little bit of you is what a lot of people need. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate that. No and I think, um, as long as you have another minute or two, okay. uh, I think even like more so on that, just thinking about, I don't know, my mindset about it, I guess. Um, My biological dad and two of my uncles had type one and they've all passed away. I was really, really young when my biological dad passed away and they've all, it was all from complications of type one and some alcoholism and just not taking care of it. So, and I've always known that from a really young age that that's why, but I feel like in a different life, I could have taken that of like, Oh no, now I'm, I'm diagnosed with type one. Like I'm going to end up the same way or like just a heightened anxiety about it all. But Mm -hmm. I guess I just want to show people that it doesn't have to go that way. Like I've, I've known that all my life and my mom was very open to me about it of, listen, this is serious and you need to take care of it. You kind of can see what happens if you don't, but you know, if you take care of it, you're going to be okay. And I don't know. I guess, you know, I can still have just kind of that like calm mindset about it, even yeah. with the history of that. You know, it's never been like this big thing in the back of my mind, like, this is what's going to happen to you. It's always just been like, yeah, I mean, that it, it's unfortunate. Like, care wasn't the same then as it is now, but I'm doing my best and I'm going to keep doing my best. So I don't mean to get too serious at the end because mm-hmm. that's a weird place yeah. to do it. But now I feel weird about making the lush joke earlier. Um, and so do, <laughs> do, do you? No, no, it's good. I'm just like, I'm like, Becky's like, you know, she's young. She's not looking to have kids. She must be tipping it back once in a while. Let me find out. if she Yeah. Has life, right. But no, I do. Do yeah. you ever think about that? Like, do, does that, I always wonder about that for like children of alcoholics. Like, do you ever think like, why well, I don't want to go too hard in this direction? Because what if it sucks me in? I honestly, I thought about it a lot more in college, I guess, just because of the atmosphere there. I mean, I didn't go to huge party school and all my friends were kind of science majors with me and we didn't party a ton. Um, But anytime I did drink or was in that scene, that's when it was most in my mind of, you know, I know I kind of have a predisposition for this. I know drinking is not a great combo with diabetes if you're not careful you know, I'm going to like really monitor and make sure, like, I would always think like, all right, I don't want to be, you know, drinking during the week. I want to always be with friends and be in a good environment. Like I want to be happy when I'm drinking. I don't want to drink because I'm upset or because I did a, you know, bad on a test or something. Like I've always thought that even as an adult now, like, I don't want to drink because I had a really hard day or I'm feeling upset. Like I want to be happy when I'm doing it because yeah, I don't want to give it the chance to go down the wrong path. That is really interesting. So my last question, based off of what you said, then I can let you go. Mm-hmm. Your mom and dad are divorced? Were, were divorced? Um, so my my mom and my my biological dad, they 
were married. My biological dad passed away when I was three and my mom got remarried to my dad. Now I call him my dad. Sure. I don't call him my stepdad. Um, when I was seven, gotcha. seven. Yeah. So he's the only dad that I remember and that I've grown up with. And like, he, he's my dad. That's why I call my, the one who has passed like my biological dad, because I don't know, I don't have like my dad connection is, is with my dad. Now. Yeah, no, of course Dude, no. they're still married. Yeah. Yeah. And I was just trying to like, like in my mind, like your fa- your mom was like, she had lived through something with your father. And mm-hmm. then she was like, I got to send this girl to church to find a boy. So she doesn't end up yeah. with a boy like I got. And uh, <laughs> that was, maybe that was the intention. I got to ask her. You, you really ask her because I think I'm right. Like, I actually feel like I'm pretty in tune with your life. So I, yeah. I feel like I might yeah, be right I wouldn't be this. surprised. <laughs> I uh, I see how your mom thinks. I I I I've I've known since she was packing extra clothes in case you peed yourself when you were eight. I was like, <laughs> this lady's trying to control stuff. Like very nice. Yep. Yeah. No, I got that. By the way, if that comes up in your in your conversations with her and you don't yeah. see your episode yet, send me an email because I will add it in the end because I would like to be right about this. Awesome. Okay. Will do. Thank you very very much. Uh, will you hold on for one second? Sure. Thanks. Don't go anywhere because Becky did email me. But first, I want to thank the Contour Next One Blood Glucose Meter for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast and remind you to check out contournext.com forward slash juice box. You deserve an accurate blood glucose meter and it shouldn't cost an arm and a leg. Don't forget if you have the chance to fill out the survey at t1dexchange.org forward slash juice box really appreciate you listening and sharing the show from the bottom of my heart. I want to say thank you. Okay, now hold on because Becky talked to her mom and then she sent me an email. I know you're excited. I am too. Just a little follow up here. Not an hour after I finished recording with Becky, I got this email from her. It says, I've gotten confirmation from my mom that she, quote, highly encouraged me to go to that church meeting where I reconnected with my current fiance, but would not divulge more specific intentions. And then she puts in little parentheses. It sounds like a setup for sure. She says she also remembers her peeing her pants while they were out on maybe two or three occasions, and that her mom remembers her telling her that she couldn't find a bathroom soon enough. That didn't send up any red flags for her mom, but it did cause her to keep a change of clothes handy. I appreciate Becky going right back to her mom for clarification on these things. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juicebox Podcast.